Good morning, colleagues, um, uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I take uh, this opportunity to thank you all for joining us uh, for this important convening uh, that has been organized by Atrocities Watch, Africans for the Poor, and the Kenya Human Rights Commission. I am Martin Mabengina. I work with the Kenya Human Rights Commission as a senior program advisor to the Transitional Justice Program, and I will be your moderator today. I encourage all of you to actively participate in these discussions. Uh, in the event that you have any questions for any of our eminent panelists and presenters, please put them in the chat section as they make their presentation. Uh, may I now take this opportunity to welcome uh, uh, Mr. Davis Malombe, the Executive Director of the Kenya Human Rights Commission, uh, to make his opening remarks. Davis. Good morning, colleagues. Um, because of my connectivity issues, I would uh, request to be allowed to switch off my camera. So comrades, uh, I'm greatly honored to welcome you to this very important online launch of the first ever, and I repeat, the first ever civil society monitoring mechanism of the European Association of Hostilities Agreement. We are hosting uh, this uh, auspicious event together with the Atrocities Watch Africa and the Afghans for the Own of Africa. So on the side of Kenya Human Rights Commission, we are participating and also providing uh, support in this important project because of two reasons. One is our mandate to provide solidarity around the emerging issues in the country and also in the region, especially around human rights and also governance and issues. And number two, also owing to the work we do on transitional justice, which has three objectives. One is to ensure accountability for the perpetrators who are involved in systemic and gross human rights violations. Number two, to the victims, to ensure these effective remedies, which are, of course, informed by international human rights frameworks and also durable solutions, especially when we have victims who have been indirectly displaced. Just a bit of background. On 2nd of November last year, Ethiopia, Ethiopia's federal government and leaders of the country, country's northern Tigray region, agreed to end two years of devastating war. The welcome deal, which was brokered by the African Union in Pretoria, South Africa, between the government of Ethiopia and the TPLF rebels, culminated into a cessation of hostilities that was announced in Pretoria after negotiations mediated by the African Union. The signing of this agreement was meant to be the beginning of a new dawn for Ethiopia, the Horn of Africa, and Africa as a whole. It also silenced the guns, opened a pathway to address critical humanitarian needs for those directly impacted by the violence. Now, eight months down the line since this development, we continue to experience significant gaps that threaten the fragile peace in the country. And it is in this context we have been involved in this monitoring and we are hosting this conversation today. The discussion today aims to provide a monitoring overview of the implementation of the agreements, which I've talked about for the last in peace and, and the permanent cessation of hostilities from the perspective of the protection of civilians. We also hope to illustrate the gaps that may have a significant impact on the protection of civilians and the growing concerns about the provisions of humanitarian situation in various parts of the country, that is Ethiopia. It is therefore our hope that some of the findings and the recommendations by the panelists and the speakers will be taken into consideration by the African leaders as they convene for the AU Media Summit in Nairobi from the 13th to 16th of this month. As I conclude, I just want to emphasize that uh, transitional justice in Ethiopia is critical and also in the region. And uh, there are also a number of conditions or consideration we need to advocate for. And, and part of it is it has to be victim, uh, victim centered, and also there has to be participation of women and also their leadership in the entire discussions and also implementation. It's also important for that process to remain informed by the regional and the international human rights obligations 
and also the regional and the international transition on justice uh, uh, frameworks, starting with the AU TJ framework, and also the many UN treaties and also tools which provide guidelines on transition justice. Beginning actually from the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, and also uh, the basic principles of the rights to remedies, which is a compendium of the major international laws, when it, which applies to constitutional justice in the region. And of course, it's also important to keep on learning from other jurisdictions. And we have seen this in Ethiopia, when they were invited in March to have a discussion around, around what was happening in the country as they were going uh, through the political framework before the uh, conflict erupted. So many actors from Africa and also from other countries in the world who have gone to Brazil justice were able to share their perspectives, which are going to inform how Sudan also uh, implements its traditional justice uh, program. So with those uh, remarks, I just want to wish all of us very insightful and fruitful deliberations, and we continue to be engaged in this process because I think this is just the beginning. So we welcome all of us also to continue supporting and also engaging in this process. Thank you. Thank you, Balombe, for those uh, excellent opening remarks. Uh, may I now also take this opportunity to welcome uh, Dismas Lukunda, the co-founder and chief executive of officer of uh, Atrocity Watch Africa to make his opening remarks. Dismas. <clears throat> thanks, Martin, um, and thanks, Davis uh, Malombe, um, and thank you, Kenya Human Rights Commission, uh, for accepting to um, uh, co-host this uh, event with us. Um, we are so privileged that uh, a powerful institution as the Kenya Human Rights Commission could agree to co-host this event with us, given the um, high profile that the institution of Kenya Human Rights Commission uh, commands on the African continent. Um, we, from the beginning, I want to thank um, their silent um, individuals who were involved in this project, in particular mapping out the outcomes of the project that we'll be presenting. Um, they would rather uh, remain silent um, for purposes of keeping their heads um, up. But, uh, we want to thank them, they know themselves, um, for the role they have played in making this one happen. Um, uh, thanks also to you, uh, Martin, for accepting me to moderate this. It's, uh, it, we don't take it for granted that people of your caliber can be able to accept to, to host and uh, moderate a function of this nature. Now, um, Atrocities Watch uh, was probably the first institution on the African continent to um, call out the conflict in Ethiopia. The uh, two weeks, no, not two, maybe had, hardly a week uh, when the uh, conflict erupted and have been the linchpad in which we have, um, uh, you know, uh, offered uh, solidarity, support, um, analysis, meetings, um, uh, you know, think, with think tanks, uh, civil society organizations, to be able to place the, pr the problem of the conflict of uh, Tigray into the context, not only within Ethiopia per se, but also within the wider context of the Horn of Africa, and hence our founding of the, um, the Africans for the Horn of Africa, which is an initiative that is hardly six months old, but it's aimed at looking at the countries in the Horn of Africa and looking at the perspective of the conflicts as they pan out within the region uh, and not confining them to one country per se, but look at them from a holistic point of view. So it's from that point of view that we come um, to agree and work with the Kenya Human Rights Commission for us to be able to get this report. It's a, a very simple report, but it analyzes. We had a meeting in Nairobi in which we had the initial thinking about what exactly the cessation of hostilities agreement meant. Um, it was hardly a month after it was signed. And we did um, a deep analysis. We had civil society organizations from across Africa. We had uh, religious leaders. We had the think tank foundations. We had civil society, independent civil society organizations, not in Ethiopia, but out of Ethiopia, but Ethiopians who came over and they gave us a deep analysis. So it's the basis upon which we support Basis, it's 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 the findings that uh, 
we thought that at this particular time, we needed to be able to put out something that can be shared by the wider uh, constituency that is concerned about Ethiopia. So um, my, on behalf of Atrocities Watch, we are pleased that we can be able to get this out and uh, to work with the Kenya Human Rights Commission in order to be able to share the findings and we hope that, that we can be able to impart on what exactly uh, Davis uh, Malonde has spoken about the different strands of uh, interventions, be it the traditional justice, be it the human rights angle, be it the women and children, be it the humanitarian assistance, whatever it is that we need to be able to make sure that um, Tigray um, and, it's, and what is happening in other parts of the country uh, does not pan out in other areas and we can be able to deal with it. So thank you so much for accepting to attend and um, we do welcome you all. Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Dismas, for uh, those wonderful and comprehensive uh, remarks. We will now get to our next um, bit, of the, uh, bit of today's convening, which is the presentation on the background of the token conflict and where the problems are, the developments are now. There will be a presentation on the key findings of the report uh, by this person, Kunda, uh, who has just spoken, but uh, I think it's important that I just give you a brief, back, uh, brief background of, uh, uh, of this person, Kunda. So this person, Kunda, is the co-founder and the chief executive officer of Atrocities Watch Africa. He's a well-recognized Ugandan who made his mark through journalism and his work on humanitarian assistance refugee protection, human rights, and international and regional developments agenda in relation to protection of basic human rights, the rule of law, good governance, and basic freedoms, and the quest for justice. Uh, Mr. Nkunda holds a Master of Arts in Humanitarian and Human Rights Law from the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, the Tufts University, and an MA in Press, Politics, and Public Policy, Kennedy School of Government, uh, Harvard University. He also holds a Master Degree. Uh, he also holds a bachelor's degree in mass communication from Makerere University, and also holds a diploma in law uh, from the University of Dar es Salaam. This uh, master is a frequent speaker before the UN, African Union, regional economic communities, international and local media outlets, and other world forums on the plight of poor and what the rights uh, rights accrue to the less privileged good governance, freedom of association, rights to movement, and displacement in international justice. Uh, this must wear as many hats as you all had, and um, he is the right person to actually give us a comprehensive uh, you know, overview of uh, this research and uh, what the, the findings of this report would be. So Dismas, uh, you're welcome once again. <clears throat> um, thanks, Martin, for those kind um, introductions. Um, now, um, I don't know whether how much we have a background about the Ethiopian conflict, but we all know that uh, um, there was a conflict that erupted between the TPLF, TPLF having been um, in power for quite some time, ever since um, uh, the overthrow of uh, Hele Meliam and Gistu, and um, they becoming a very powerful agent in terms of the running of the country of Ethiopia. But that's not the point. The point is that this report, this me mechanism, monitoring mechanism report, um, has some very disturbing um, issues that we have been able to identify, um, particularly uh, in, the, in the, the cessation of hostility agreement between the TPRF and the Ethiopian government, um, which has quite a lot of significant gaps about the protection of civilians. Um, I'm certainly sure that many of you know um, exactly what uh, has been happening within uh, Tigray, uh, not only Tigray, but also in other areas of Ethiopia. And I'm more than happy to answer any questions that may be asked about uh, the connectivity between the different uh, um, hotspots that are happening within Ethiopia and why they are happening at this particular uh, time and the, um, why now this should be happening now. Um, but this particular report uh, produced by a coalition of regional and international civil society organizations, um, which is titled the Ethiopian Watch, is intended to be able to highlight certain aspects of that agreement that was signed in Pretoria. Uh, the gaps therein, um, I remember that at one point when we were discussing having a meeting about this uh, 
the cessation of hostilities agreement, we did discover that actually it is one of the most unique agreements that you can ever have. It's not, it's, when you read it, it doesn't sound like an agreement. It sounds more as an instruction that someone is telling someone you have to do the following things. It's not an agreement is supposed to be a consensus between two individuals of saying that I will do this, you will do that. But in this particular one, the cessation of this agreement, it's an instruction that is being directed to one party and telling them these are the things that you must be able to accomplish within a certain prescribed time of time. Um, the report also describes uh, the cessation of hostilities as a momentous achievement that improved the situation in Ethiopia. Ethiopia had gone, in particular, um, the tensions between Tigray and the uh, Ethiopian federal government had reached a level in which um, the tensions had um, reached, uh, you know, fever levels to the extent that this cessation of hostilities agreement was actually a very, very, very deep welcome. Um, welcome achievement that improved the situation in Ethiopia a little bit. Uh, Tigray will tell you that they had so many problems. They couldn't achieve, they couldn't get money, they couldn't, there was no banking sector, the humanitarian situation was dire, there was a, uh, the children were no longer going to school, sexual violence was at its highest, human rights violations were at its highest, but the cessation of hostilities agreement, which was a welcome uh, breath for everybody, including the Ethiopian government, was certainly a momentous achievement that improved the, the, the situation in Ethiopia a little bit. Um, but within, even, uh, even, even if we think that it had these achievements, there were certain gaps that we found within uh, this particular association of uh, um, this agreement. In particular, the presence of the Eritrean troops in part of Tigray, uh, particularly the Eritrean troops who are being accused of killing civilians and continuing sexual violence and forced dis disappearances. Um, that one has not even uh, uh, ebbed at all. It's still uh, in, in people's minds. So that is a gap that has not been addressed because part of the uh, agreement was that the Eritrean forces were supposed to leave the territory of Tigray, but unfortunately they haven't been able to, we have no evidence of the exactness of whether they have been able to leave or not. Then the intensification of the conflict in other areas of Ethiopia, uh, particularly in the Amahara and Afar, um, they have also had it in Oromo. Um, I'm certainly sure that uh, uh, the people on this uh, call know that, we, that there has been talks in Zanzibar between the Oromo uh, Liberation Front and the Ethiopian government, which has not yet been concluded, but that has not let off other areas such as Afar and Amahara, which also are, th are having issues to deal with the central government of the, uh, the, the federal government of Ethiopia. In other words, uh, what this report says is that there is a fractured assessment or in, in, um, uh, an assessment of exactly how to deal with the different um, areas of Ethiopia that believe they don't have um, the kind of attention that is exacted by the federal government. In other words, you have a problem in Tigray, you have a problem in Afar, you have a problem in Amhara, you have a problem in Rome. Is there a concerted effort to be able to deal with the entirety of Ethiopia in order to get a, settled, a settlement of the problems that are be, uh, be, 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 uh, besetting the country? Um, now, the other area is that these uh, in Western and Southern Tigray remains the, uh, unresolved uh, by the agreement, uh, yet clear that there are clear drivers of instability in other parts of Ethiopia, which have to be dealt with. But this report also notes that at core of at core four of the cessation of uh, the cessation of hostilities agreement commits parties to condemn acts of se sexual and gender violence, yet no public condemnation has happened on sexual violence committed by either troops on either side. And I'm saying on either side, both the Tigray and also on the Ethiopian federal government troops. There is also total absence of women from the delegations mm -hmm. um, on the yes, parties. Uh, can you yes. interrupt? Uh, could you please turn on your camera? My camera? Yes, if you don't mind. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm hoping I, I'm hoping that it doesn't, um, my network might be not very good, but if it's, uh, uh, yes, I've been, yeah, I've been requested by colleagues, colleagues uh, in comms because they're streaming the conversation on uh, other, uh, other social media platforms. So, yes. Thank you. Uh, please go ahead. 
Okay, so so it it does find that uh, this total absence of women and uh, um, in the official delegation. Um, I think it's only one woman who's named within uh, parts of this delegation, and we find that women's absence, and in particular in the peace process, is equally telling that uh, we are missing a big portion of individuals who have a high stance in, in what is happening in, in, in Ethiopia or lack of thereof. Um, there is also, we find that there is also lack of transparency in the work of the official AU monitoring and the verification and compliance. Um, little resources have been put into place for that particular purpose. And we do believe that in order for uh, that mechanism of the AU for monitoring and verification has to be uh, given the necessary support that will make it um, useful in terms of uh, achieving the aim of the cessation of hostilities agreement. Now, what are the key messages? The key messages that we get is that the, the, the cessation of hostility agreement um, is positive. It has positive steps. It's uh, bringing about peace and reconciliation. I know that the African Union has already celebrated and said that it's one of the best that they have ever gotten, uh, including parting themselves, which I think is ill-advised, that is too fast. But uh, we think that there is much more improvement that is required uh, in order to be able to um, limit the scope and uh, cover up the gaps of the implementation of the uh, hostilities agreement. Um, we also think that the African Union led peace deal um, must be fully implemented because we do believe that it's one of the rare things that the African Union has been able to achieve. And it can be an example of things that the African Union can be able to do in future because um, few few uh, successes on the Africa Union in terms of the peace agreements they have been able to explore have been as decisive uh, as this one because uh, the importance of Ethiopia in the geopolitics of the region um, is very well known. Um, so I'll end up with the um, a few key messages that we found out into this report. Um, just that. One of the statistics that we found that is very appalling is about the 2.3 million children um, who are still out of school, uh, despite the schools opening in 2023. And this has largely been hampered by um, schools serving as shelter for IDPs. In other words, 2.3 million children out of school for a period of this almost, uh, you know, almost a, a year and a half is uh, nerving enough that uh, we don't know what's going to happen in terms of the future of those children and in particular how that impacts them in, um, in, in their development as future people who are going to be running the causes of, of Ethiopia. We also find that there is a problem with women and children who remain vulnerable on the question of gender-based violence, um, living in crowded camps, and none of the parties to the cessation of this argument has publicly been able to condemn and say what kind of heinous uh, crimes are being committed by making people live in such a conditions. So we are um, calling that, uh, that the cessation of this argument reached in Pretoria November is a positive step and very good for reconciliation in Ethiopia. But there are certain aspects of it, which I know that my colleagues are going to speak about, Jaffet, uh, Anne Moyo, and others. They will be able to give us a little bit of deeper understanding of some of the subject, for example, the transition of justice and how it's panning out on the, in Ethiopia, um, in which transitional justice has been narrowly defined to look at the political process, but not the accountability process. So there, there are other people who will be able to give us a much more nuanced understanding of that. So from me, um, I, I thank you, Martin, for being able to allow me to share the findings of this report. And I'm certainly sure that people will be coming up with questions which I will be uh, happily be able to happily answer. Um, for now, thanks, Martin. Uh, thanks, Dismas, uh, for that one, uh, for the excellent presentation. Uh, and also for sharing those you know, statistics on uh, some of uh, some of the violations that have happened in Ethiopia and also the gaps uh, uh, that have come about with the cessation of the facilities agreement. Uh, I would now like to call on our next speaker uh, uh, who will make a presentation on uh, 
who make a presentation who, who make a presentation on on the reflections of the reports and outcomes and implementations for sexual and gender-based violence dimensions of the conflict in Ethiopia. So our next speaker is Anna Moyo. Anna Moyo serves as the executive director of, uh, of, of Anna Moyo serves as the executive director of CSPR in South Africa. Uh, she is a thought leader and highly skilled and competent professional with extensive executive directorship and senior management experiment, experience. She's passionate about justice, reparations, healing, and human rights for all in real and tangible terms. She's, a, she's skilled in uh, legal writing and analysis and has vast experience in international relations, stakeholder management, fundraising, research, advocacy. I just mentioned one of you. Uh, Anna, uh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, and good morning, everyone. Um, I don't know if I, uh, I've put my video. I, I hope I'm okay. Yes. yes okay. Yes, Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, I'll speak um, about conflict related sexual violence um, in Ethiopia, basically, and just highlighting some of the issues uh, that uh, this report has highlighted. And of course, some of the challenges and problems relating to issues of gender-based violence and conflict-related sexual violence in Ethiopia. Um, as we all know, um, Article 4 uh, speaks of, of the peace agreement speaks um, about protection of civilians, and specifically, uh, it provides that the parties uh, should condemn any act of sexual and gender-based violence, any act of violence against children, girls, women, and the elderly, including recruitment and conscription of child soldiers and support family reunification. And what has been challenging on the ground is the fact that, first and foremost, it is challenging uh, to fully assess the extent to which the peace agreement has reduced the high levels of sexual violence um, experienced during the conflict um, in, in, in Ethiopia, for instance, particularly rape and gang rape perpetrated by all parties uh, to the conflict in Ethiopia. What we have seen uh, mostly is that there is no condemnation uh, of this conflict-related sexual violence in spite of the documentation of these cases by civil society uh, and other institutions um, such as INGOs who have really done um, a lot in terms of really uh, documenting the human rights violations on the ground. Uh, what is also worrying um, is that uh, whilst there has been no condemnation at all, uh, which already is a violation of Article 4, um, there has also been um, not enough, particularly in terms of documentation around uh, how many cases of conflict-related sexual violence um, have been, um, uh, how, uh, how many cases have, have been committed of this violation on the ground. And these problems are really not um, uh, only special to the Ethiopian case. So for instance, in terms of statistics and some of our findings, um, we have determined that um, as of the 16th of February, 2023, about 852 cases of sexual and gender-based violence were reported in centers that are set up to help uh, survivors of gender-based violence and conflict-related sexual violence. And about 26,000 women and girls in Tigray uh, are estimated to have sought medical assistance as a result of sexual violence, including rape and gang rape. Um, according to reports uh, issued by the Center for Women's Justice. And we know from practice that these numbers are actually just a fraction of um, the cases actually um, happening on the ground um, because again um, of, of, of specific issues attended to coming, to coming forward by women uh, and girls to talk about these issues. We know that when women come forward, it's only a fraction of these women, whilst ma the majority of women who may be victims usually suffer in silence out of fear of being stigmatized and ostracized from their families and communities once the violations are found out. So whilst the numbers themselves are quite alarming of women who've come forward, but we know that uh, a number of women actually haven't come forward. This is just but um, 
a fraction of the, of the women who have suffered. And civil society reports are by Amnesty International and other key human rights organizations, including the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission, have actually uh, highlighted cases of conflict-related sexual violence uh, in, 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 in Ethiopia. We have seen some bit of condemnation uh, by the Tigrayan authorities, um, particularly around um, uh, violations committed by Eritrean forces, but we have not seen uh, 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 any, any admittance by the uh, TPLF, for instance, of wrongdoing. And from the reports that have been uh, issued, it's clear that all parties have committed conflict-related sexual violence and gender-based violence uh, during the conflict. So the lack of condemnation and the pinpoint, the, the, the blaming, for instance, of others to the exclusion of all parties is also quite worrying uh, as we seek to highlight issues of conflict-related sexual violence in the conflict in Tigray. We've also seen some form of um, dismissal by the federal government um, particularly in response to the US State Department's report that atrocities have been committed by all parties uh, when it comes to conflict-related sexual violence. So this is also worrying, particularly as we also try and deal with the transitional justice uh, issues in the country, uh, which particularly focus also on issues of conflict-related sexual violence and gender-based violence committed by um, the, 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 the military forces in the country, whether the TPLF, uh, the, 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 the government soldiers, the Eritrean uh, uh, um, uh, forces, and many other forces, for instance, even some of the communal uh, community-based um, uh, 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 forces that have been mobilized uh, to respond to the conflict by the federal government of Ethiopia. So issues of conflict-related sexual violence are quite a concern for us. And as, as, as you may see in the report, uh, we have highlighted the numbers that are available in terms, of the in terms of the research and the reports that have been made available either by the media, by the US State Department, by uh, INGOs and uh, human rights organizations who have been active on the ground. However, the numbers are still not quite telling in terms of uh, how bad the situation is of conflict-related sexual violence in the country. I'll end here for now, Martin, and then perhaps I can answer some questions when they when they come up during uh, the plenary. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Anna, for, uh, for your presentation that shared you know, with statistics and gaps um, uh, in terms of you know the violations that uh, women and girls continue to face and how uh, they have not been addressed uh, despite the cessation of uh, hostilities. I believe. So at this point in time, I would want to invite um, our distinguished guests and participants uh, to ask uh, to pose questions to Anna and Dismas following their presentations. Uh, we do have a few, uh, we do have one question in the comment section. So anybody can take it. Uh, and there's, there is a question or comment from Pauline Zamundu who says, with all the efforts from where you see, it, what does, what does the intervention by the AU portend for Tigray region and the rest of the country? Is the country stable or could it be a window of opportunity for the parties involved in the conflict to arm themselves for a more ruthless military engagement? Uh, that is a question from Collins Omundu, one of the participants. So Anna or uh, Dismas, you can answer that. Um, and then the, um, the rest are more or less of comments. Uh, but before you answer those questions, Anna and Dismas, maybe I could just pose two more questions to you. Um, but you can answer the question in the meantime. I didn't get the question, Martin. Can you can you repeat it for me, please? Thank you. Yeah. Yes, it was more or less fast. It said, so the question was, with all the efforts from, uh, from where you see it, what does the intervention by the AU portend for the Tigray region? That is one part of the question, and for the rest of, you know, the, other, the rest of Ethiopia. And, uh, and that part of the question reads, is, is the country stable, or could it just be a window of opportunity for the parties involved 
in the conflict to arm themselves for a more ruthless military engagement. Wow, that's a, um, it's, it's a wide ranging question, uh, Martin. Um, but the Africa Union, um, the little that I know is that uh, um, something that they have been patting themselves on, um, uh, saying that this is partly uh, one of the most um, rewarding experience. Um, we had a meeting in the Addis Ababa with the, with the Commission of Ankole, the Commission of Peace and, and Security. And in one of the engagements that we had with him, he said that this the peace process uh, in, in Tigray, uh, in particular in Ethiopia, was one of the most comprehensive and, um, you know, uh, something they needed to pat their backs on for having succeeded in bringing two strong uh, protagonists to be able to uh, sit and be and have the kind of uh, the cessation of hostilities agreement. Um, internally, the, the cessation of hostilities agreement um, was much more. Um, it had much more things behind the scenes than what we have seen. It had so much involvement, not only of regional interventions, uh, regional governments, but also it had international and in particular the American involvement uh, was very significant. The Tigrayan conflict um, was necessarily not um, an, a, a, an Ethiopian problem. It had regional and international dimensions to it. So there are so many countries that had interest in what was happening in Tigray. There are countries like Ethiopia, sorry, countries like uh, Turkey, countries like the United Arab Emirates, countries like Egypt, uh, Sudan, um, and even South Sudan. All those countries had interest in what was happening, including Kenya itself. So the, 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 the intervention by the African Union was based on the thinking that there were there was a lot at stake in order in order to leave um, uh, a, a collapsing Ethiopia. Ethiopia is too big for the regional force for the region to allow it to to collapse the level that it had gone. And in particular people did not understand the regional ramifications of the Tigray becoming a pariah or making Ethiopia disintegrate because the federal nature of the Ethiopian um, arrangement is that the different parts of Ethiopia, the Tigray, Amahara, Afar, Olomo, the different areas of Ethiopia have a certain strength that they bring about into a more stable Ethiopia. So the Africa Union um, felt that this was a very important piece in its history in order for them to be able to say that we have brought about some semblance of peace on the Africa. But in the beginning of this particular conflict itself, after the African Union was coy, it didn't have a lot of say in the processes because uh, there were a lot of conflicts because conflicts uh, are rising out of the presence of the headquarters of the African Union being in Addis Ababa and the Addis Ababa dictating and saying that African Union can't have a say in what is happening in the internal matters of Ethiopia. But it is at the tail end of this when the cessation of hostile agreement that came to be discussed that the African Union became a very pivotal part of this process. So uh, is this agreement um, a, a large in order for the different parties to arm themselves? No, because what we have seen is that there have been mechanisms that have been in place, like we are saying that the monitoring and evaluation mechanisms that have been put in place in the African Union, they have been able to say that their arms which have been um, laid down, there have been certain armies that have been moved from various places to another, there have been laying of arms uh, down, there have been you know, um, agreements that certain positions have to be changed. So I, we don't think that this is uh, um, a chance for people to arm themselves, but rather it has a genuine impact on every, uh, the warring factions, all of them were tired about the war, they were getting a way out, and this is the best chance that they have in order to stop the fighting that they're having. So um, I, I, I guess, I don't know whether I have given the right answer for the question, but that is uh, the thinking behind uh, what we have been following so far. Uh, uh, thanks, Dismas. Uh, you have done justice to the question. Uh, there is another question. Um, and I would direct it, it's from Joseph Angina, and I'll direct it to you, Anna. What is the core stimulus for the 
Ethiopian conflict, what is the line of solving the impasse to favor each side? That is from Joseph Mangina. Uh, the other question is from uh, uh, from Fumiaret Gabriel Libanos. I hope I got that right. And uh, says, uh, uh, dear, thanks for the engagement of the Alliance of CSOs of Tigre, a consortium organization of 72 CSOs. I've uh, been following the questions. How you see? How do you see the commitment of the parties to the conflict to implement the cessation of hostilities agreement? Uh, do you think that Eritrea and Amhara region officials are already publicly rejecting the agreement, and that the federal government is not playing its role? So that's a question from Mary, and the previous question, uh, Anna, and uh, this month was from Joseph and uh, Joseph Vina. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, I, I, I mean, I can attempt to answer and really add on to what uh, Dismas uh, uh, has said. Um, I think when we look at the Ethiopian conflict, for instance, and the peace agreement uh, specifically, um, the peace agreement only focuses on um, on Tigray um, and, and, and the federal government. And we see a lot of something that we have criticized previously. We see a lot of um, concessions being made by the Tigrayan government. Um, and uh, it really is some form of victor's justice um, to, uh, and, and the victor being the federal government of Ethiopia. So there is very little benefit from the peace agreement uh, for, the, for the TPLF, um, so to speak. Already, we are seeing an imbalance um, of power in negotiations in the peace agreement, which already is a threat to the survival of the peace agreement and its implementation when you have one piece one party to the peace agreement um literally conceding um and the and the other party basically uh um, um being the winner um of of all the processes that are being implemented it almost points to all atrocities being committed by one party to the exclusion of the other which already makes um the peace agreement and its implementation skewed um, and then there's the issue as well of um, the fact that there is a lot of violence, there is a lot of atrocities being committed elsewhere in Ethiopia, in other states, for instance, and that is not included. And with only two parties to this peace agreement in the country, we are already excluding other pockets of violence uh, and conflicts that are happening, intercommunal uh, conflicts that are happening elsewhere in the country. And this already poses a lot of challenges for the success um, uh, of this peace agreement when it comes to its implementation and the TJ components um, as well to the peace agreement. Um, so uh, when you ask Joseph, what is the stimulus for the uh, Ethiopian conflict? I think elsewhere uh, we have problematized this um, as, the, as, 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 as civil society organizations led by atrocities watch Africa and um, uh, the Kenyan Human Rights Commission as we monitor the Ethiopian conflict. Uh, we have problematized that the issues, the real issues on the ground are not being um, addressed. The issue of polarization, the issue, for instance, of um, uh, 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 identity and belonging, these issues are not um, addressed uh, even through the peace agreement. And these are some of the root causes of the conflict. If we continue ignoring some of these issues, which are really important when we're trying to uh, forge um, um, a journey towards uh, establishing peace in Ethiopia. So indeed, we are not addressing the real issues and we continue as well to have this skewed justice, this imbalance of power, even in the negotiations and the so-called uh, peace agreement that has only really achieved cessation of hostilities. But if we continue to implement it in the way that it is, it's highly likely that we'll see recurrence of conflict in the country, particularly given the fact that a lot of concessions are made by one party to the exclusion of, 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 of others. And if we are to take a leaf from the South Sudanese process, for instance, the peace agreement of 2015, and where we are now with the AR, um, the revitalized agreement um, of, of 2021, we, where we now have more parties coming forward, more than the parties that we had initially when we had two parties 
uh, to the conflict, signing the, the original peace agreement. So the need to bring all parties, the different warring parties, the different types of conflicts that are happening in other states is really important if we are to secure peace and really address the conflict um, in, 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 in Ethiopia. Um, I can also perhaps speak a little bit, um, maybe adding um, around issues of conflict-related sexual violence in the country. Um, it's important um, as we address these issues that also the transitional justice uh, processes that are currently being undertaken in the country through the consultations um, um, and the development of the national transitional justice policy, uh, the policy is supposed to be um, uh, 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 submitted by the, the drafting uh, uh, um, party, the drafting committee by September. Already the issue of consultations uh, has been skewed, for instance. So if we are to really secure peace or, or forge a path that takes us towards sustainable peace, we really need to do the processes um, uh, holistically and not only pay lip service to some of these processes, but we need meaningful participation, consultations that are genuine with everyone. And for conflict-related sexual violence cases, we really need to reach far and wide um, and ensure that survivors of conflict-related sexual violence and gender-based violence actually inform the component that will seek to address their lived realities and experiences. And we have not seen this happening. We've only seen documentation by civil society we have only seen uh, commitments by other stakeholders, but not by the state or the warring parties to addressing issues of conflict-related sexual violence. And so there are a lot of gaps, there are a lot of challenges, particularly in the way the peace agreement is being implemented right now. We are seeing a lot of um, movement, a lot of activities, but these activities are not really incorporating some of what perhaps we'll speak later about uh, what is, um, contained in the African Union Transitional Justice Policy, which is a continent-wide guide on how member states who are uh, addressing the consequences of conflict in their own national jurisdictions can implement transitional justice processes in ways that are consultative, in ways that also embody uh, some of the principles and with benchmarks of success of such TJ processes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. So the two questions for Christmas. Uh, the first is, uh, there is a widespread narrative that the conflict in Ethiopia is now under control. Uh, it's now under the control that the, uh, now that this now that this coalition say, is saying otherwise. Uh, in your opinion, what are the key missing elements in the cessation of hostilities agreement that you have identified to make this assertion? That's the first question for Christmas. The other question is. Uh, what are the key findings of the report pertaining to humanitarian assistance? Is it getting through? Is it not? Uh, what is the state of humanitarian crisis? Uh, what is the state of the humanitarian crisis post? Uh, the cessation of hostilities agreement. Uh, this was. Um, I, thanks. Thank you, Martin. Um, I think the 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 this particular cessation of hostilities um was a welcome relief for all the conflicting parties um both the federal government of Ethiopia was tired the rebels themselves were tired they needed a breathing uh, some place to breathe and it was one of those welcome um i i don't want to go into the details of exactly how it happened uh because some of them uh there are facts which are too detailed for um, a, an open conversation like that, like this. But it was so uh, welcomed by both parties to the extent that even its verification, uh, even its implementation became, um, was fast enough. Um, one of the few uh, agreements that was implemented as quickly as possible, simply because not only had Tigray been starved of quite a number of uh, social services, um, the humanitarian situation in Tigray was very dire. The death rates of people dying of hunger was very high. The, uh, it, the Tigrayans had been denied of a number of um, social services, including but not limited to, for example, banking. They didn't have money. There was no finances. They didn't have access to water. They didn't have access to food. They didn't have the uh, humanitarian assistance agencies did not have 
capacity to deliver uh, the humanitarian assistance that, that was required in the region. So anything that was within the agreement that could allow a key way in which certain aspects of life-saving skills or life-saving uh, assistance was needed could reach in, in Tigray was very, very much um, a welcome uh, change of heart. Um, as the, so so the, then the point then becomes as to who was more interested in it, both, both, both ways, both the, the federal government and the Tigrayans were very interested in it, simply because there had been a lot of military jokering in between. You remember that point when we said that Tigrayans were 25 kilometers out of Addis Ababa, the Ethiopian government had to be able to remobilize and recruit quite heavily in order to be able to stem off the, the impending threats that was coming from the Tigrayan forces. But the point is not that. The point is that, um, like I said in the beginning, everybody was tired. There was a need for everybody to be able to say, we need to pull and, and, and we get back to, because the cost of the war had become too much for any, any of the, the parties to bear. Um, if the, but, but then if you come back and say, what is it uh, currently? Currently, there has been a little bit of an improvement in the kind of uh, humanitarian assistance that is reaching Tigray. Um, recently, there was a RAL, there was a bit of a problem because part of the humanitarian assistance had ended up becoming the food, particularly the food aid, had ended up being sold. So there was quite a lot of investigation, suspension in terms of the, um, uh, the, aid that, the food aid that was reaching uh, the people in, in, in Tigray. So there has been an opening in terms of the financial services, the banking system has gone back. There are flights that at least now are going into Tigray, um, but in the, in the, in the, at the height of the fighting, there wasn't any flights that were going there. Uh, there has been a little bit of opening up the world. And in other words, uh, the restrictions that had been put in place for uh, a, a Tigray to remain uh, obscured from the rest of the world has been a little bit lifted. Uh, so the outside world that can be able to go in and see what exactly is happening. So I would think that this cessation of hostilities agreement, much as it isn't the most perfect agreement in the world, it has had a positive impact in the lives of the few. It's not the perfect solution, but at least it has had a certain level of impact in terms of the people of Tigray uh, from the period when in November 2020, when the, the conflict began up to now. Um, has it transcended and been able to address all the problems? No, not necessarily. There are still so many problems that exist. Uh, the question of which uh, my sister Anne Moya has been speaking about, the question of sexual violence. There has been, been answers to those questions. The questions of people who have committed the crimes and they have been uh, prostituted, uh, being held accountable for the crimes that they have committed. That one has not been done. Uh, the spread of uh, the existence of the Eritrean forces, like we said, which has remained um, a cancer on the, uh, on the, on the, on the, on the hearts of uh, Tigrayans. And then the spread of the conflict in other areas of Ethiopia, yeah, like we said in Afar, in Amahara, and in, in Oromo. Uh, in other words, the quest for understanding of how to deal with the multiple problems that beset Ethiopia, different parts of Ethiopia, and how to deal with multiple functionalities of different ethnicities in, in a country like Ethiopia, as big as Ethiopia. So, so I don't know whether I answer that question or if I have not touched the exactness of the answer. I would be much more than happy to um, to get a different version of the question. Thank you, Martin. Okay, thanks. This must be did answer the question. Uh, there's one more question for Anna. Is the African Union an effective arbiter in the conflict, given the various other extra regional interest, uh, interested parties and also uh, super power men? Um, that question is for Anna, right? Yes, this question is for Anna. Yes, um, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. And that's a very difficult question. Um, and I will try and answer it um, <laughs> as, as, um, as, as um, honestly as possible. Um, I think uh, from, from, um, from just um, a process, uh, uh, political process point of view, 
because of um, the principles of subsidiarity and complementarity, um, actually the African Union should come after ICAD, for instance. So the actual arbiter is, um, should be ICAD um, of this conflict. And the African Union really comes in at the behest of um, uh, uh, ICAD, when ICAD, for instance, has failed to address the issues. This is when the African Union can come in. So when we really follow the principles of subsidiarity and complementarity, the African Union really comes last. But because transitional justice is also one of the key components of this process, and because also Ethiopia is also a country under the African Union, so issues have been brought up um, at the peace and security, uh, at, at some of the monthly peace and security meetings, uh, sessions, for instance, and of course, at the African Union Commission, um, through, its, through its implementation of the African Union transitional justice policy, it has come in particularly uh, given the, 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 the TJ components of the peace agreement, for instance, particularly for their implementation. But I think the biggest challenge we have had is that, again, Ethiopia is the headquarters of the African Union. And some of the things we have lamented during the conflict was that the African Union was definitely silent in condemning um, the atrocities committed uh, during the conflict, either by the federal government and other uh, actors in the conflict in Ethiopia. So that was a big concern already, and which already sort of compromises the position of the African Union being the arbiter of this conflict going forward, when they've been silent, um, when atrocities were being committed, and now coming in because of the peace agreement, as well as the transitional justice component contained in the peace agreement. I mean, Disma spoke earlier about the consultative meeting that was held by the African Union uh, in March, um, where they really brought in experts, international experts and continental experts for a, 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 an expert roundtable to discuss um, the transitional justice component for Ethiopia. And even during that process, you can already see that uh, the fact that Ethiopia is literally the host of the African Union, that already means that there are a lot of concessions um, um, for the African Union in what can happen. And there's a lot of deferring to the African Union. Um, there's a lot of deferring to the, to the Ethiopian government on the processes and how these processes should happen. So for instance, um, where the African Union should be really vocal in terms of what processes and what needs to happen. We are not seeing that happen. So to answer the question in short, is the African Union um, um, an arbiter, a, a, well, an effective arbiter of this conflict? I think we are seeing a lot of concessions from the African Union, and we are seeing also a lot of deferment to the Ethiopian government on the processes. So there's no calling out um, of the Ethiopian government on some of the processes. From a process perspective, we've for instance, problematize the fact that uh, a period of six months is not enough for consultations that will contribute to the development of a national teacher policy in Ethiopia. And this is a cause of concern already given the issues on the ground and just the, the, the size of the, of the, of the, the geographical size uh, of the country and the need to ensure that everyone um, is consulted on the issues on the ground and that as much as possible participation, particularly by victims, is taken into account. The principles of the African Union transitional justice policy, for instance, are already uh, compromised uh, in trying to implement the peace agreement, particularly the TJ provisions and other provisions within the very limited timelines that have been offered. So there hasn't been a lot of thinking through of some of these processes, and we are not seeing the African Union pushing back on some of these issues. Perhaps when you are being hosted by the very party that you are you are, you are an arbiter to, um, this is what happens. These are some of the concessions, and these are some of the trade-offs that happen. But unfortunately, these trade-offs are quite um, they, they they really impact the effectiveness uh, and the success of the process that the African Union is trying to spearhead in Ethiopia. Uh, th thanks, and and uh, just as a way of following, I wanted to ask um, earlier on. Uh, on this mass and uh, along with uh, you made the opening remarks, you know, they both alluded to the need to expand some more voices into this composition. So uh, 
in your opinion, um, uh, you know, can you exp can, do you think that there's need to have more voices in this conversation, other than you know, the, other, than, other than the government and, and um, the TPLF? And what would this entail, and why has it not already been done? That the, uh, that question is for me, Martin. So either either you or Anna uh, can answer that. Um, no, actually, the uh, there has been actually quite a number of uh, uh, voices that have been involved within with the um, with this conflict in Tigray. Um, I can tell you that. Uh, it is possibly one of the few conflicts that has the highest number of, uh, um, what do you call them? Um, uh, you call them what, that's the one that is used, uh, envoys, special envoys, right? Um, so you will have, the, there's the European envoy, the US envoy, the Africa Union envoy, the, you know, the, the, the EGAD envoy. So there are so many envoys that at one point, um, I remember that we are having a meeting, um, I and quite a number of uh, colleagues, uh, Chenga Kenna and Shufai uh, Guzman, and we are in New York and we are wondering, because we are having and saying, uh, why do, do we have so many envoys and they don't speak to each other? In other words, the, if you, this Tigrayan conflict raised quite a lot of um, concerns for many people. There were so many meetings, so many heads of states in the region were concerned. Uh, I do think that we all remember the concerns that came from South Africa, the concerns that came from Kenya, the concerns that came from Uganda, Egypt, and uh, ETC, and other countries. Simply because Ethiopia is a too large a country. It's a country that has a lot of strategic importance that it cannot be left alone. It cannot be allowed to disintegrate because it has regional ramifications. It has refugees it has to send into Sudan. It has ramifications on the plight of uh, the, uh, the, the, um, the, what you call terrorism and in the region, how it, it pans out with Somalia. So there's quite a lot of interest that was garnered in terms of dealing with the question of Tigray, uh, not only for purposes of for settling the problems of Ethiopia, but also to be able to stem out any regional uh, ramifications of the problem. Now, the other aspect was, of course, which is not discussed in much detail in, in, in many of the forums, is the question of the Renaissance Dam. The Renaissance Dam had its own um, central part in this conflict because then it had the bearing of what exactly Egypt and Sudan were thinking in terms of uh, either support for or non-support for the Tigrayan forces or even the federal, the federal government of Ethiopia. The, the, the Renaissance Dam has quite a lot of uh, resonance in terms of the regional politics between uh, Ethiopia, uh, Egypt, and the Sudan, because um, that its 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 development, its build up, its filling up the dam has a resonance in what Ethiopia, in, sorry, in what Egypt uh, and Sudan does, and you can have a deeper thinking. I think maybe that's another 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 um, thing we need to be able to organize around is the regional implications of the Renaissance Dam on the conflict, the current conflict in Sudan. But over and above is that there is a lot, there was quite a lot of uh, uh, international support, the European Union, the Americans, the, uh, one of the countries that was very important for us uh, when we were meeting the UN Security Council was the interest island has on the problems in Ethiopia. I think there's no country in the world that has a very deep understanding of what is happening in Ethiopia and interest uh, like Ayla. The question becomes why? Why would they be so much interested? So, they, so the, the, the short answer, Martin, is that there was quite a lot of international interest and a lot of speaking in terms of even the uh, coming to the agreement of this session of hostilities agreement in Pretoria. It had quite a lot of international interest and so many countries were involved. And I do still believe that up to now, there's a lot of interest on solving the problem of Tigray, between Tigray and, uh, 
and the federal government of Ethiopia for not only uh, regional interests, but also some countries' uh, bilateral uh, relations that they think uh, will be hurt if this conflict continues. So thank you. Okay, thanks. This was so. There were two hands of, from the, the participants. Uh, those, so there was a hand by uh, Mr. Oshiro Heiri. Uh, Tom, Ernest, could you please uh, allow Mr. Oshiro Heiri to pose his question or comment? And then earlier on, uh, as I say, uh, Mr. Roland Boli had raised his hand. Okay, maybe we'll come back to that much later. So at this point in time, colleagues are uh, distinguished guests, allow us to go to the next uh, segment of uh, this conversation, uh, which will be a panel discussion on prioritizing peace in Ethiopia. Uh, the panelists will uh, reflect on what the AU mediators and the international community need to do to ensure that groundwork for substantive peace is laid in Ethiopia. And uh, we will have two panelists for this important conversation. Uh, the first panelist is uh, Dr. Jafet Biagon. Uh, Dr. Jafet Biagon is an international human rights lawyer, practitioner, and academic with a special focus on the human rights, uh, on special focus on the African human rights system and the intersection between human, international human rights law, international humanitarian law, and international criminal law. Uh, uh, he is a leader and manager with experience in senior executive posts and the ability to effectively lead others, motivate excellence, and efficiently manage resources. He is a holder of a doctorate in law from the University of Pretoria, a postgraduate diploma in international protection of human rights from Abo Academy University in Finland. He holds a master's of laws uh, from uh, the University of Pretoria and a postgraduate diploma in legal practice from the Kenya School of Law. And lastly, a Bachelor of Laws degree from the Moy University in Kenya. Our other panelist is, uh, is Anna Moy, who I earlier on introduced. She is the executive director of CSVR in South Africa. So I want to invite uh, both of them uh, to reflect on this uh, on uh, the subject of this conversation right now. So I'll invite uh, Jeffish to start us off. Uh, welcome, Dr. Uh, uh Thank you, Martin, uh, for this opportunity and the Kenya uh, Human Rights Commission uh, together with the uh, Atrocities Watch Africa and the uh, Africans for the Horn of Africa. Uh, for this kind invitation to participate in this timely and uh, important discussion, just when the African Union uh, is about to hold uh, its uh, session here uh, in Nairobi. I want to make uh, my point uh, up front, uh, and that I'm going to focus on the question of justice and accountability. And my proposition is that the African Union and uh, the United Nations must uh, prioritize and ensure that justice and accountability is part and parcel of the transitional justice measures that, that are, are, are hoped to be undertaken uh, in Ethiopia in regard to the conflict that has taken place uh, in Northern Ethiopia. As uh, Anna Moyo had uh, already mentioned, Article 10.3 of the Association of Hostilities Agreement provides that uh, the Ethiopian government uh, will implement a comprehensive national transitional justice policy that will be aimed at uh, accountability, truth, justice, and redress for victims. And that this comprehensive transitional justice policy will be, uh, uh, will be consistent with the constitution of the country, but more importantly, with the African Union transitional justice policy framework. Uh, this mass has already mentioned that uh, really unspeakable atrocities, unspeakable abuses and violations were committed in the context of the conflict in Northern uh, Ethiopia. 
ranging from mass killings, uh, sexual violence against women and girls, uh, displacement, and, and, and forced disappearances, torture, and a, a wide range of, of, of violations that rise to the level of crimes against humanity and war crimes, most of which have been uh, 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 documented not only by organizations like Amnesty International, but also by uh, uh, the independent uh, experts, uh, of, of the, the UN independent experts uh, on Ethiopia. But uh, there are reasons not to be very optimistic that uh, Article 10.3 will be implemented in full and that eventually victims of these violations and abuses will see justice and accountability. Why do I say that, uh, 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 that, that, that we, we, we cannot be very optimistic that uh, uh, this provision will be implemented. And that's why the AU and the UN must be very vigilant and uh, ensure that the exact pressure on Ethiopian government to ensure that really justice and accountability is seen uh, and reparations for victims. Why do I say that we, sh we, we, sh we really should be vigilant, we really should not be very optimistic, but ensure that we are vigilant? I want to propose four specific reasons. One is that uh, we are dealing uh, with a country where there's been a deep culture of impunity. Human rights violations have been recorded at least since 1991, uh, and, and there have been attempts to find justice and accountability uh, throughout these years, at least since 1991. But we have seen that a very deep uh, uh, culture that has nurtured violence mainly by government uh, security forces, but also by uh, uh, armed groups. But throughout all this period, there has never been a comprehensive justice and accountability mechanisms that ensures that perpetrators are held to account. And for this reason, uh, lack of accountability, accountability deficit has been the common denominator and has actually fueled the cycles of violence that we have seen, including the most recent conflict in Northern Ethiopia. And therefore, there is really a, a strong culture uh, of, of impunity in the country. The second is that there's been, there, there are gaps in law. Uh, and unless these gaps in law are, are addressed, then it's, it's unlikely that we are going to see a credible justice and accountability mechanism established to hold perpetrators to account. Why do I mention gaps in law? For instance, the country's criminal code does not deal with crimes, does not provide uh, does not prescribe and does not uh, uh, provide sentence and punishing uh, for crimes against humanity, for instance. Yet we know that there is documents and documents that have been published that show that crimes against humanity have been committed in Northern uh, Ethiopia in the context of conflict. So there is, there is that lacuna in the law concerning uh, how these crimes are going to be, to be, to be committed. Secondly, is that uh, uh, currently, as, it, as things stand, military courts uh, are of exclusive jurisdiction for trying uh, uh, crimes, especially committed by, 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 by military officials. The result is that also is that uh, there is no you know, uh, uh, guarantees about the independence, the impartiality of these military courts, and also that we know that according to the African Commission guidelines on the right to fair trial, civilians. Uh, who have committed crimes in the context of this uh, 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 in context of the con cannot be brought into into military courts. So a much more robust, comprehensive uh, mechanism outside of military courts uh, is needed. We know, for instance, that in May uh, 2021, the Attorney General announced that at least uh, uh, some uh, 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 four soldiers had been convicted of crimes under international law that had been committed there, including uh, a sexual violence. But the opaqueness of the process, it's therefore difficult to, ver to verify details of the trials, uh, including the charges, the sentencing, the number of soldiers, and all that. So the military courts will not be able to offer the justice and accountability that is envisaged, for instance, in the IU transitional justice uh, uh, policy. But perhaps more importantly is my third uh, a, a reason why we need to be more vigilant when it comes to questions of justice and accountability in Ethiopia, is that we have seen a very open resistance and blockade of accountability mechanisms by the Ethiopian government. In, 
February this year during the African Union summit that was held in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, the Deputy Prime Minister categorically said that they are going to push for the termination of the mandate of the Independent Commission of Human Rights of Experts in Ethiopia that was established by the Human Rights Council. And this uh, 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 push to terminate prematurely the mandate, yet the mandate of this commission of, of uh, the mandate of the, of the commission uh, of, of experts really should be seen as complementing the, 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 the uh, cessation of hostilities agreement. But more importantly, it is only the, the only existing credible mechanism that is currently collecting and preserving evidence of the crimes against humanity and war crimes that have been committed uh, in northern uh, uh, Ethiopia. Yet the Ethiopian government has clearly and made a strong campaign to prematurely terminate uh, uh, this mandate. And that did not just stop with, uh, uh, with, with targeting the HRC uh, mechanism, but also the African Commission, Commission of Inquiry that it had established back in 2021. It also said that uh, and, and has discredited the Commission of Inquiry right from its uh, uh, establishment uh, up to a point now we have seen uh, in May uh, during the African Commission session, the African Commission took the unfortunate, disappointing decision to actually now terminate the Commission of Inquiry that it had established uh, to, 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 to investigate work, to investigate violations of human rights uh, in Tigray and the northern uh, region of the country. So we see that the targeted discrediting, the targeted resistance and blockade of access of these international mechanisms to investigate uh, human rights violations has now led to the termination of a mandate created by an African-owned African Union body, the, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. So there is, a, there is, there is really reason uh, uh, to be pessimistic that the same government that is resisting and blockading international uh, uh, bodies established to investigate uh, violations of human rights will also then uh, uh, create effective, credible, independent, and impartial mechanisms to investigate uh, the, the, the crimes that have been committed uh, in northern uh, 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 Ethiopia. Then finally, the fourth reason uh, is that there are ongoing human rights violations. We know that for, 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 for justice and accountability to be pursued uh, effectively, credibly, uh, and, and for transitional justice processes like truth and, and, and reconciliation processes to take place, there must be an environment where citizens, victims, are able to speak freely, are able to speak about their, 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 the harm that they have suffered, their lived realities, and the experiences that, that they have undergone. Yet what we see uh, is that there is continual uh, human rights violations. There is a chilling environment. Uh, we've seen the arrest of, uh, of, of peaceful protesters. We have seen the arrest of journalists and staff in the last one year or so. We have seen a uh, government imposed blockade of social selected social media platforms. So there is a shrinking civic space, yet the civic space, an open civic space, is a prerequisite for a credible and, uh, and, 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 and meaningful transitional justice process. For these processes to take place, there must be an open, uh, and, 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 uh, an open uh, uh, civic space allowing for victims, civil society, journalists, and other uh, uh, stakeholders in the society to be able to speak freely, to be able to, 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 to follow the process uh, in a meaningful way. So I think for these four reasons, there is really great uh, 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 reason for the African Union, for the United Nations, to be very vigilant in terms of ensuring uh, Article 10 3 of the, of the, of the uh, Cessation of Hostilities Agreement is actually brought to life and that enough sufficient pressure is exerted to ensure that eventually we have a credible justice and, and, and accountability mechanism that will see that uh, the violations, the abuses that have been committed in this country, the lived realities of victims and, and, and these abuses and the violations are not simply washed away because now uh, uh, there has been uh, a cessation of hostilities argument. Thank you very much. Uh, 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 
Uh, thank you very much, Martin. I think I'll stop there with those uh, four particular points. Uh, thank you, Dr. Biegon. So I want to now welcome uh, Moyle, uh, the Executive Director for CSBR, uh, to also um, to reflect on uh, this particular subject of discussion. Thank Anna? you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Um, so I'll, I'll just pick up from where uh, um, uh, um, Dr. Ajafet ended, perhaps focusing on the African Union transitional justice policy and some of what it offers. And then I'll round up with some of the uh, new developments uh, from the Minister of Justice uh, uh, side in terms of how they are trying to address some of these issues and perhaps highlight some of the gaps there. Uh, and, and perhaps opportunities that we can engage to really ensure that um, the, the, the peace that we are seeking for Ethiopia is not only um, uh, attainable, but also that it, 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 it can be sustained uh, going forward. Um, so already when we look at um, just using the point of departure of um, uh, what uh, Jaffet has highlighted, particularly around issues of justice and accountability, and just addressing um, some of what is happening on the ground. Uh, when you look at the push, for instance, for implementation of Article 10, uh, the national TJ policy, um, I, I've said this earlier here that um, we are concerned as civil society and TJ experts um, about the speed at which um, the, 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 government, the federal government of Ethiopia wants to implement uh, and have the policy adopted, the national teacher policy adopted. Already, this is exclusionary. This is a process that is really too hurried uh, and cannot really uh, 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 satisfy the requirements of effective participation or meaningful participation of those most affected by the conflict in Ethiopia, particularly uh, victim groups uh, and victim networks um, on the ground, affected communities by the conflict and so forth. I spoke earlier as well problematizing um, the, the, the peace agreement uh, that it's very much skewed towards the federal government of Ethiopia. And we are seeing one party to this conflict making a lot of concessions and it has been signed. So already that's problematic in the sense that you literally have um, a cessation of hostilities agreement that is, that is a form of, in courts, victor's justice. So the transitional justice process is really going to um, uh, um, become a victor's justice type of process um, and, and, and even what will be achieved through the, the implementation of this peace agreement is literally going to amount to victor's justice. Whoever uh, uh, is uh, the victor literally has to um, uh, 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 win almost at every point that is being made. That is already problematic. And as a result, this could actually lead to recurrence of conflict. I think in some of the questions and comments in the chat box, some of the, 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 the CSOs and experts uh, on these issues are uh, based in Ethiopia are already highlighting that um, there, is a, there is a rejection, a growing rejection of some of the provisions and some of the processes that are currently being carried out by the federal government of Ethiopia. So this is a big challenge. Um, when it comes to issues of conflict-related sexual violence that I spoke about earlier, uh, consultations really have to also take into account that victim groups uh, or, or survivors of conflict-related uh, violence and, ge and gender-based violence that have been committed um, as, 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 uh, during the conflict also take into account that victims will need some form of awareness raising, some form of sensitization on what this TJ process is, what the options are that are put on the table, for instance, to choose from what are the merits and demerits of some of these processes. And this is not happening. Uh, and through this hurried process of consultations, we are literally not um, uh, affording victim groups or those affected most by the conflict opportunities to make informed decisions, particularly around what TJ options they would um, for instance, favor because they don't know uh, what are the merits and demerits of some of these processes. So there hasn't been sensitization beforehand on the different processes. And what we fear most, particularly for conflict-related sexual violence um, uh, cases that have been rep recorded 
is again the issue of how do you then, for instance, um, ensure that the lived realities and experiences of women and girls are going to be redressed through the TJ processes that are going to be prioritized in the country, be it truth and reconciliation commission, for instance, or a TJ commission, uh, how are we going to ensure that women are going to participate and that even the reparations, be it the interim measures that are the interim relief or the actual reparations that will be issued are actually going to address uh, the disaggregated uh, realities of women on the ground across culture, across religion, uh, across the different identities and so forth. So those issues have not really been uh, 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 addressed adequately. So we are rushing a process. So we are not ensuring meaningful participation of those most affected. So it's going to be an elitist type of document that will literally focus on those who are mostly in cities, who uh, knowledgeable about transitional justice, uh, who can participate in these processes to the exclusion of those who really need uh, their violations to be redressed the most. Um, so this is a big challenge. So when you go to the African Union transitional justice policy that the Ethiopian government is supposed to be implementing through its own TJ process, for instance, we already see that the issue of uh, local ownership, the issue, for instance, of um, um, nationwide consultations, the issue of consensus building, uh, for instance, are already compromised um, through this process. Although we still speak as well of issues, for instance, of ensuring non-discrimination through the AUTJP as some of the principles that foreground implementation, effective implementation of transitional justice in a, in a country context, we are seeing already some of these principles being uh, uh, um, in a way, for lack of a better word, violated already, since it is a policy that all member states are supposed to implement. So we speak of uh, uh, sequencing and balancing of TJ priorities, the issue of justice and accountability. I think uh, uh, Dr. Jo uh, 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 Jaffet has already highlighted the gaps, the lacuna, for instance, when it comes to these issues um, and, and just what problems we are likely to face if we are to chase justice and accountability, particularly for the atrocities and international crimes that have been committed um, during the conflict. I won't delve into that, but I will highlight, for instance, uh, the fact that when we speak of justice and accountability, particularly for conflict-related sexual violence uh, cases that have been recorded, the biggest challenge that we are going to face, for instance, um, is again very much the issue um, um, that um, the government is not going to prioritize this issue on the one hand, but on the other hand, victims, uh, for instance, are not going to be mobilized to participate in this process, whether it's going to be through the national courts or it's, if it's going to be through an established mechanism like um, or a hybrid form of mechanism that will prioritize uh, addressing the international crimes committed, um, like what is being proposed for South Sudan, the hybrid court of South Sudan, I think we will need that kind of mechanism really to address these issues. It could be a special court or a hybrid court, but really prioritizing the international crimes that have been committed and the participation of victims in this type of uh, 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 mechanism also have to be uh, addressed um, during the um, uh, during the consultations or when victims so um, choose to have this type of mechanism as one of the priority mechanisms uh, to be addressed. So again, issues of uh, sequencing and balancing of TJ priorities, particularly balancing them against other uh, processes of nation building. This is again, one of the top challenges of TJ processes in a country that is um, trying to transition from conflict to uh, a peaceful democracy. And again, here in Ethiopia, these conversations are not being held for instance, and this is a challenge. So we are seeing pockets of what is happening uh, towards implementing the, 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 the cessation of hostilities agreement. But again, all of this is happening in silos. Victim groups are not really consulted as much as they should be. Uh, civil society actors, for instance, their voices, they've already been um, uh, uh, left out in the, in the development or in the, in the negotiations for this particular peace agreement. So we are seeing this exclusion uh, continuing even in what um, the, 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 the Minister of Justice is doing in terms of implementation 
uh, of some of these processes. But I want to end with some of the processes that are currently underway as, as, as of uh, the month of June, 2023, particularly around transitional justice. One of the things that the Minister of Justice has done is constitute a team of experts uh, to enact legislation on the international crimes. Um, whilst this is commendable, perhaps addressing some of what um, uh, Dr. Jaffet has raised, um, there are still, uh, as Jaffet highlighted, gaps. Uh, if we are going to have this legislation um, that is going to look at enacting or developing uh, some form of legislation on international crimes, again, the issue then of to what extent or to what effect um, is this legislation going to really be linked to some of the uh, processes? For instance, uh, Ethiopia, uh, so for instance, Jaffet highlighted that we actually don't have, the national courts do not have the capacity around addressing international crimes. Um, and this is a big challenge. So a lot of crimes against humanity have come up. So even if we have legislation, what will this mean? For instance, will it establish this court uh, as a special mechanism that will actually seek to address international crimes and its operationalization? I think this is perhaps one of the processes to watch um, as we also monitor implementation of the peace agreement in, 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 in Ethiopia. Perhaps a step in the right direction, but again, a lot of gaps in terms of how is this actually going to be carried out? It's not enough to merely have experts, a team of experts drafting this um, legislation, but it's also very important again to have victim groups participating and civil society participating in some of these processes. I think the challenge is that this process is still very much held by the Minister of Justice with a few selected, hand selected experts from uh, civil society uh, in, uh, uh, are coming on board. But again, the issue is, are we really having the right people being part of some of these processes, or are we still going to see an elitist type of process that really brings those in the know-how to the exclusion of those most affected? Secondly, the government is planning to start a process of lustration, uh, focusing mainly on prosecution um, and other law, um, of, of, of specifically of those who've committed atrocities um, and uh, other law enforcement agencies. I think for me, this is a cause of concern for us um, as civil society monitoring what is happening in Ethiopia, particularly given that the peace agreement specifically almost highlights one party being the perpetrator and the other party uh, being um, uh, um, almost innocent of committing atrocities during um, the conflict in South Sudan. So as we have said earlier, the peace agreement is very much favorable to the federal government of Ethiopia. So any process that focuses on vetting and illustration is automatically going to focus on one party to the conflict being the perpetrator. So we are going to see a lot of um, uh, illustration and the removal of a number of, 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 of people, perhaps from the Tigrayan side, but to the exclusion of those who committed atrocities from the government side. So again, a cause of concern when you are implementing um, such an, a, a, a skewed uh, a peace agreement that favors one party uh, against um, the other. So this is a challenge. So we are likely going to see the TPLF people being the ones who are the benefit, who are the, who become, who are targeted by this uh, vetting illustration process uh, and nothing happening perhaps to the federal government um, uh, agencies and officials who may also have been implicated in committing some of the atrocities from documentation by civil society and INGOs on the ground. Uh, lastly, another perhaps uh, development is that there is um, an attempt to sort of look at traditional justice mechanisms or traditional dispute resolution mechanisms uh, and linking them to um, linking them to the national criminal justice processes, for instance, trying to perhaps do what uh, you, uh, uh, Rwanda did with the nationalization, for, for instance, of your gachacha system um, and ensuring that uh, the gachacha system um, aids or supports what was being done through the national courts 
and pay, uh, uh, that nationalization saw so the, the, the upscaling of the gachacha system, a traditional justice mechanism to address issues of um, low level uh, 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 crime that were committed, particularly in communities. Something of that sort is also being, um, uh, uh, um, is also being intimated upon by the, um, by the Minister of Justice to see how local dispute resolution mechanisms can contribute to the criminal justice reform and peace building and trying a process that incorporates some of them in the formal criminal justice system. Again, another development for us to watch and ensure that um, this nationalization and adoption of traditional dispute resolution mechanisms also happens in ways that do not show change the victims on the ground, particularly ensuring that conflict-related sexual violence and international crimes, as Jaffet highlighted them, crimes against humanity, um, are actually not part of the crimes that are going to be tried through some of these processes. So again, the ensuring that there is also some form of um, uh, um, separation of what crimes can go into your, your, your national courts, what crimes can go into your adapted traditional uh, 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 justice mechanisms that seek to aid uh, implementation of justice and accountability for lower level crimes and that the higher crimes or the international crimes actually are afforded a separate mechanism altogether that will highlight um, the, 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 the chain of command as well as the, 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 uh, the seriousness of those crimes committed at a higher level. Thank you. I'll end here, Martin, back to you. Uh, thank you, Anamoya um, and uh, Dr. Begon for your rich presentations. Uh, we have a few questions uh, from the chat section and uh, they can't be answered by either of you. Uh, the first question is uh, from uh, Wandia is, what are the measures being taken to stop the escalation of the conflict to other areas like Ampara and other regions? And then the second question from Yared uh, is, given that there is a huge imbalance of power, which poses risk to the very implementation and that some of the parties in the conflict are blatant to rejecting key clauses of the session of hostilities agreement, which are not, which have not so far been met with meaningful responses by the Ethiopian government. What do you think will be the fate of the agreement? So those are two questions from the chat section and um, either you can answer it, even uh, this must be either of you can answer. Uh, Dr. Bigon. Uh, thanks, Martin. I, I think, uh, Dismas, I'm sorry, I'm going to put you in on the spotlight. I think Dismas has much more than I or Anna really invested in analyzing the, the, the peace process uh, uh, and, and can speak to the power imbalances. Uh, but there's a question about Wandia about how what is being done to stop the escalation. I, I don't think it's the, the the violence, the conflict had already by the time the the association of hostilities agreement signed had already extended to other parts of, of, of Ethiopia. And that's why we now speak of the conflict in northern Ethiopia rather than the conflict in Tigray, because it had also extended to other areas. And, uh, the cessation of hostilities has somehow uh, uh, slowed down or, or, or stopped the active conflict. But as we said, uh, there's still other violations and still this distrust between the uh, communities and all that uh, that is happening. Uh, unless Anna Moye wants to add to that. But I think on the question of power imbalance, perhaps Dismas can uh, chime in. Uh, thanks, Dr. Biegon. Anna, do you want to add on? Uh, to pick up on what uh, from Jaffet, Dr. Begon, or before uh, this must comes into the um, to answer the other question. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Martin. Uh, perhaps just to add and then uh, then uh, hand over to to Dismas to answer some of the yeah to answer the question around the power imbalance fully. He is more um, yeah he's more he's more yeah he 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 will know more about this from the work that they're doing. But perhaps just briefly to add on to what Jaffet has said, 
I think that's exactly the challenge when you have a peace agreement that actually has two parties to the table and we know that violence is happening elsewhere and there has been this um, uh, uh, overemphasis on uh, uh, the Tigrayan conflict, for instance. So this is a challenge. So we're almost seeing uh, what has happened in Tigray eclipsing other, 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 other violations that have been committed elsewhere. And part of what we are doing, even through this report, is shine the spotlight on what is happening elsewhere in Ethiopia. And documentation uh, efforts by various organizations have also highlighted the same, that there are atrocities, there are human rights violations happening elsewhere in the country. And civil society in, um, in, uh, in Ethiopia have also highlighted uh, also what is happening in other states in Ethiopia. So I think there is a need. That's why we're also saying the consultations really need to be nationwide because the national teacher process is going to also be a national process. So there is a need really to um, cast the net wide and look at all atrocities that have been committed and gross human rights violations that have been committed in the country. So I think that's a concern that we have, but again, something that we are trying to see how some advocacy efforts can actually also um, lead into shining the spotlight into what is happening elsewhere uh, together with some of the documentation efforts uh, and reports by civil society actors. So I think definitely there is a need to nationalize the process and highlight the atrocities that are being committed at a national level, particularly in other states that we have highlighted here. Um, and and, and um, also casting the net wide right in terms of who are the perpetrators or actors to the different conflict, including the community level uh, actors as perpetrators um, um, of the different types of conflicts that are happening um, in the country. Um, around the power imbalance, I think uh, perhaps before handing over to, uh, to Dismas, I think this is something that I have pointed out, right? Uh, when I highlighted that the peace agreement is almost your victor's justice, and we are already seeing pockets of rejection of some of the provisions, which also could have a devastating effect of uh, plunging the country back into conflict if some of these issues are not actually taken care of as part of implementation of the peace agreement. I think that's something really to watch. We have seen countries um, going back into conflict because of some of the disagreements and rejections of certain provisions of the, of, the, of the peace agreement. And again, the biggest challenge being that you have the political players um, signing the peace agreement to the exclusion of the actual people, the affected communities on the ground. So when it comes to implementation, which requires mobilization of the most affected, particularly the communities and um, the, the, the constituencies that political players are representing, this is where we see rejection of some of the provisions of a peace agreement. Again, another, uh, 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 another red flag, um, particularly when it comes to implementation, we could see recurrence of conflict if some of these issues are actually not addressed adequately during implementation of, 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 of COHA. Uh, this must over to you to answer perhaps more fully uh, and comprehensively this question. You are sure that I will answer it comprehensively, and you, 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 may, you may be surprised that you just answered it very well. Um, no, um, I think part um, of the um, the problem with the with the cessation of hostilities agreement is that it's it's actually when you read it and you juxtapose it or you put it against other agreements that uh, one has read before. Like I said in the beginning, uh, uh, it's more of an instruction, more than a compromise. It's an instruction. It's 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 the shortest agreement that I've ever read. Um, I don't think it's more than how many pages. I think it's about three to four pages, and the, it contains explicit, very 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 sanctive things in which it says you will do the following. In the in the four days time, you will do the following. In one, one month's time, you will do the following. It's instructions that are being given to the TPLF that you are doing, you went through the following. You'll have to disarm. You'll have to lay down your arms on such a day. You'll have, it's, it's not, I would say, it's an agreement because it, it was reached between two parties. 
But if I was to give it a different term, I would say that it was an instruction from the Ethiopian federal government, the, TP, the TPLF. Um, and like I described in the beginning is that when you look at the way and the manner in which it was reached, it was one of the quickest and the easiest and the fastest agreement that was reached in such a short period of time, uh, facilitated by many international actors. Um, the, like I said in the, earlier in the beginning, there was quite a lot of influence from international actors. The United States was very, very crucial in terms of, of making sure that this uh, cessation of hostilities agreement was reached to, uh, to the extent of facilitating the process of the uh, delegation of TPLF to be able to get to Pretoria, accommodate them, feed them, and fly them back to Mekele. So, so there's, there's, there is a lot of discussion that can go around about how that uh, um, the cessation of hostilities agreement and the, its imbalance was reached. But th that's not the point. The point is how, what does it, did it bring about any uh, change that was needed at that particular time? Yes, um, there was a, a, a kind of, uh, the tensions that had reached the fever point uh, ebbed in a way that now we have some form of, uh, we have a, a, an interim administration now in the, in Tigray, uh, we are now seeing the Ethiopian government uh, trying to speak to the other groups of people that feel disfranchised, uh, such as the, the Amahara, the Oromos, and the people of Afama. So it has had that particular cessation of a disagreement, much as it had its own problems, it didn't have the comprehensiveness that we wanted. Uh, as described by both Anne and the uh, Japheth, but at least it has had an impact in which we all can now start seeing that we can get access to uh, Tigray, we can be able to access the people who are the, the victims, the IDPs. Okay, students have not gone back to school, but at least they are not under the same harsh conditions that they were. Uh, schools have not opened fully. We haven't been able to get the humanitarian assistance that is needed, but it's a process in under which at least we have a verification mechanism, some mechanism that can be able to tell us and say the following things are happening in that country. So I don't know, um, Dr. Bergon, you put me on spotlight. I don't know whether I have answered exactly what you wanted me to say, but if I haven't said it, maybe you can complement it or minus what I have not said. Uh, thank you, Dismas. Uh, so this book, thank you, Dismas. So at this point in time, I want to invite one of the guests uh, to pose a question, Mr. Oshiro Ahiri, who had earlier raised his hand. Uh, Oshiro? Uh, Oshiro? Okay, we'll come back to Washira. So there's a hand that's been raised. No, no, I'm, I'm there. Oh, okay, please proceed, Washira. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, the conveners of uh, this meeting and uh, to please. the other. Washira, Hello. Washira, please turn on your camera. Please turn on your camera. Okay. Hello, hello. Yeah, uh, good morning, all of you. Now, my, qu my question is, uh, I had posted it a bit earlier uh, when I raised the question about the effectiveness of uh, the African Union as an arbiter, uh, as an effective arbiter. Uh, but there was another component uh, of that question that uh, I thought that uh, we, we need also to flag it out. That is uh, the position of uh, Ethiopia and uh, the conflict uh, in Ethiopia, the one we are talking about, the peace, uh, the, the peace agreement, within the, we locate it within the context of the geopolitics, uh, uh, the international geopolitics, and the importance of uh, uh, Ethiopia as a, a locus for interest by other external players, like uh, the superpowers. Uh, all, you see, the superpowers wanting to establish a foothold uh, in Ethiopia. Uh, so I could see a situation whereby there are other extraneous players who are fueling, fueling that conflict. 
uh, to the extent that uh, what we are having now is uh, something more of like uh, an uh, anesthesia, a cessation of a situation. Then we will have a position, uh, a situation like now the extended, uh, uh, drawn out uh, peace process, uh, list with all these uh, very sweet sounding words like uh, uh, transitional justice and uh, all these things. But I wanted us how do we extricate uh, the African situation from the influence, which is actually mostly adverse? Uh, because when you go, when you think about the politics, the political class, uh, what uh, Anna was trying to call the elite, the elitist, the way they interpret and view the conflict and the solution to that conflict, it does not translate to the benefit of the people who suffer the conflict. So uh, I, I wanted us maybe to give uh, to give it a bit more thought, and that's why I was a bit hesitant to to to, to look at the although the African Union has, has come up with this very nice. Uh, nice uh, sounding uh, AJP policy. But now we also need to learn lessons from other situations whereby the African Union has led uh, peace processes. And uh, maybe I can also uh, share the, uh, the, the situation in Kenya, whereby in 2007, 2008, when there was a conflict in Kenya, and then there was this uh, national dialogue process, there was immediate cessation of uh, whatever. But the fact that there were so many gaps that uh, came in into the process after the, the ICC process, there was the, which flopped, there is the, uh, the TGRC process, which also uh, uh, flopped partially. Now, when you look like a, a situation like in Kenya, we are now back to where we were in the, the, the environment, the toxicity, the polarization is just like we were in 2007. So what I'm saying is that we need also to, to rethink this uh, uh, transitional justice approaches, especially in African uh, situations, whereby we need also to first look at a country within its specific context and the, the dynamics, the political dynamics that actually are in play in that country. And uh, that is where maybe we will talk of a meaningful process. And uh, that's why for me, I'm a bit uh, very pessimistic about uh, that peace agreement because it's just a lull before, for me, it looks like, like a lull before another storm erupts. And uh, there are all these other, now we can see the situation in uh, Sudan. Sudan and the proximity of Sudan and Ethiopia, the interest of uh, a country like uh, Egypt, the, they would actually want an extended uh, conflagration of the situation in Ethiopia. Then there are the external players. So do we stand to have a meaningful uh, peace and sustainable peace process in Ethiopia? That's my question. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ashura. So, uh... This past Dr. Begona, Anna, you could answer Washara's question, but uh, Anna, maybe I could direct uh, some questions specifically to you uh, from the chat. So there was one, there's one from Real Mouse. I hope I got it well. Uh, what are the best practices to put conflict-related violence against women on the priorities of the government and actually taking this crime seriously? So that's a question for you, Anna. The other question still for you, Anna, is um, like you said, uh, succession of facilities argument refers one over the other. Uh, and this is a question from uh, Wandia. Uh, you also said that because of this demobilization only targeted the TPLF and not the federal agencies, the view is that the federal agencies are the ones to be in monopoly of violence and TPLF should not be armed. Uh, do you mean to include uh, Ampara? Forces, or do you think the federal forces should be included in demobilization because of their members? Because their members took part in the violation of civil rights. Uh, so, Anna, that's a question from uh, Wandia from the chat box. The earlier question was, uh, what were the best practices to put the to put conflict-related violence against women on the priorities of the government, and what is actually taking and how can they actually take this seriously? So in, in, in regarding the, the aspects of accountability. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for the questions. And thanks, Real, um, and the anonymous attendee uh, for the two questions. I'll start with the question. 
uh, on conflict-related sexual violence. I think um, it really starts when, uh, and I can give a few examples, it really starts with documentation, um, uh, providing uh, uh, statistics and data around the occurrence and the prevalence um, of, of these issues and, 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 and perhaps even uh, uh, qualitative data around the types of conflict-related sexual violence. I think to a certain extent, we have some of that information already in Ethiopia and recommendations being made by various um, uh, documenters. I think uh, the report that was issued by the Ethiopian Human Rights Commission previously had some cases and a number of other INGOs and human rights organizations have also highlighted these cases as well and making these recommendations uh, to, the, to, the, to the Minister of Justice calling for uh, prioritizing these cases in TJ processes uh, and other peace processes that are currently being implemented is important. Um, I, I think the other, perhaps the missed opportunity as well with the current peace agreement uh, is inclusion uh, of, of, of gender experts, for instance, in the on the negotiation table uh, to talk about these issues, highlighting these issues. So currently we have the article four that I spoke about earlier, uh, talking about um, issues of gender-based violence and conflict related sexual violence, but it only calls for condemnation of these. So again, it shows the missed opportunity of having experts on the table uh, to really highlight and craft um, uh, provisions that are all encompassing in terms of how these issues will be addressed going forward. So even though we do have um, Article 10 um, and other articles pointing to transitional justice processes, these are not explicit in highlighting uh, how conflict-related sexual violence cases can be addressed, for instance. So I will say documentation is important. And when it comes to actual implementation, uh, through TJ, for instance, we have seen best practices in, in a number of countries. South Africa, for instance, had to literally do women-only hearings to encourage women to come forward to talk about their own uh, conflict-related sexual violence experiences um, uh, during apartheid era violations uh, and doing so in a safe space, but also ensuring that um, there is no um, um, uh, after effects of ostracization and being stigmatized and not being accepted in their families and in society. Uh, we have seen also documentation um, experiences as Shura is here, I see Shura is here, but there has been documentation um, uh, processes that focus on conflict-related sexual violence cases in South Sudan, for instance, by the Commission for Human Rights led by Yasmin Suka and Shuvai is the, is the gender expert um, uh, within that commission where there is specific prioritization of documenting conflict-related sexual violence uh, violations and giving them that prominence um, within the bigger report with specific recommendations on how to address those. So your follow-on TJ processes will also have to implement some of those recommendations. I think the latest example that we can give around best practices in implementation of TJ processes where conflict-related sexual violence cases have been um, addressed through a TJ process would be the Gambian uh, Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission process where we also saw prioritization of um, gender-based violence cases uh, during the 22-year the, the authoritarian rule of Yaya Jame where many women were raped by Yaya Jame and some of the soldiers, for instance. So we saw basically the, 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 the Truth, Reconciliation and Reparations Commission literally having a six month period that focused only on uh, uh, hearing cases uh, of gender-based violence um, targeting women who were violated by Yaya Jame during his reign. So that kind of prioritization, even within TJ mechanisms, has been some of the best practices that we've seen where these issues are prioritized and um, 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 they and there is specific focus on even ensuring that reparations, interim relief measures actually prioritize some of those violations. And women victims and survivors, for instance, or survivors of conflict-related violence in all their diversity are also prioritized within that process um, in terms of their reparation. But what we haven't seen happening is the disaggregation of reparations, specifically targeting the lived realities and experiences 
of women who are survivors and women and girls who are survivors of conflict related sexual violence. And this is where we are pushing now um, to say we actually need not adopt a one size fit all to all victims, but we actually need to disaggregate the needs and the reparations uh, that should be afforded to women according to their experiences um, during conflict, for instance, where they are victims or survivors of conflict related sexual violence. Uh, the other question um, that was asked uh, around um, whether demobilization should also include other actors to the conflict, definitely we need to basically see a balance because again, there is this tendency uh, to think that atrocities are committed by one party. And this is not true. Your uh, truth commission reports uh, from different teacher processes uh, that have been undertaken, South Africa, for instance, Sierra Leone, Liberia, uh, even the Gambia, usually highlight that uh, atrocities are committed by various parties, including the government, for instance. I think in South Africa, we saw that happening as well, where uh, the, the ANC also committed atrocities, even though they were really the victim of the apartheid era system. So usually there is this imbalance when we are now trying to come to a, a peace process or where we have a peace agreement. I think we have highlighted several times here to say that there is an imbalance when it comes to um, who really uh, 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 um, uh, benefits from the peace agreement. We are seeing a lot of skewing of the peace agreement favoring the federal government of Ethiopia to the uh, perhaps and, and, and pointing to the TPLF as perhaps the perpetrator and a lot of concessions being made by uh, uh, the, the, by the by Tigray um, with the state literally uh, being in charge of most of these processes. So when now we are looking at a TJ process, it's important that then we literally have a process that looks at the conflict in its entirety. Uh, I think earlier uh, 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 Jaffet and Dismas highlighted that we are seeing the conflict actually in other regions of Ethiopia. And this is important to also bring in what is happening elsewhere, the conflicts, including even the, the communal conflicts happening elsewhere into the ambit of this national uh, uh, process, uh, particularly the TJ process, and ensuring that the processes of vetting and illustration processes, for instance, of DDR also focus on everyone uh, who is implicated uh, from the from, from from the federal government of, of, of Ethiopia to some of the, 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 the state uh, 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 political actors who have been implicated, who have also carried arms uh, and who are also committing uh, uh, low level conflicts within their own regions. It's important that basically we have an all encompassing process where the different processes also target everyone and uh, not one party to the exclusion of others. If we are really going to have peace in Ethiopia, it's important that then this peace is nationalized. It does not only target specific groups uh, in society, but basically all different contributors to the conflict at whatever, at, at, at any level, are also part and parcel of the processes that are happening, be it either as aggravators, as perpetrators, or as victims of the atrocities that have been committed. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. Uh, there's a question for Dismas uh, from Peace Amita. She's curious to hear your thoughts on the dangers of pushing for traditional justice mechanisms in countries such as Ethiopia that have uh, that have very many and diverse cultures and a history of marginalization in the political space on the basis of ethnicity, unlike the Rwanda, unlike Rwanda, where the culture, cultural and traditional practices are relatively similar. So dismiss your thoughts on that. Um, can you repeat, Martin? I didn't get it clear. So uh, Peace Amito is curious to hear your thoughts on the dangers of pushing for a traditional justice mechanism in Ethiopia uh, that has very many diverse cultures. Uh, unlike Rwanda, where the culture and traditional practices are relatively similar. So what are your views on the pursuing a traditional justice mechanism in Ethiopia? Um, okay, uh, that's a hard one. Uh, but um, the first thing that we need to know is that uh, uh, actually Ethiopia, they speak the same language. Uh, 
the you, you if you are an outsider you would be it would be very difficult for you to be able to tell who is a, from Tigre who is from Amahara and who is from who is an Oromo by just uh, listening to them uh, they all uh, have a particular way in which they can be able to converse um, they have um, one particular strong religion uh, which uh, they confess to um, I mean the majority of them are Orthodox, and then you have the Muslims. Uh, so, if, if if you are to look to juxtapose with Rwanda, given that Rwanda you have one language, uh, and the majority of uh, Catholics, um, they, they almost have a, a similar configuration. The difference is that <clears throat> in, the, in, the, in the politics of Ethiopia is that Ethiopia has very strong different regional areas irrespective of the fact that they can be able to understand each other linguistically. Uh, so you have the Amahara, you have the Afa, you have the Romo, you have the Tigrayans, you have other small tribes, the Somalis, uh, different tribes that have strong sentiments about their tradition, about their well-being, about uh, who they belong to, their, 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 their social affinity. Um, so if you are going to do a traditional uh, mechanism that is going to encompass all Ethiopians. Uh, it's going to be uh, centered on the nationality of Ethiopian. Ethiopians are very uh, particular people about their belonging in, in the nationality of Ethiopia as a country. One of the most important things that uh, has made Ethiopians coalesce together, one of the most important, and I'm saying one of them, not only, and it's something that uh, if you are a person that wants to change the thinking of Ethiopians, you need to concentrate on. One is one, the development of the Renaissance Dam, like I said. That dam is so important that people have invested heavily into it, irrespective of whether you are Tigrayan, Amahara, or Romo, or anything. The second one is their national dish. And then their national dish, their coffee, their food, their injara, their kit for their dorowot, their food. Their food is very important. It's part of their identity. And then the other important thing, which we have seen from the outside, is their national airline, which is the Ethiopian airlines, part of the, what the world sees. But more importantly, and the other aspect that makes them seem truly making Ethiopians be part of what they are, is their athleticism, they are running, they are marathon, they are competing with other, with Kenya now and parts of other countries that are becoming marathon, marathon. So those are some of the identities that make Ethiopians very important. They are coffee, very important. But in terms of saying that they have any difference with other countries, it's far, far from that. I think a transitional justice mechanism that anchors on the, um, anchors on the, the, uh, the facets, on the things that make the Ethiopians think they're Ethiopians and can be able to be use them as a basis of bringing justice to any victim of any of the conflicts, or indeed as a basis of them having a discussion or a talk or um, uh, of saying that we can't be able to treat, mistreat each other simply because we belong to each other, we have each other's, uh, uh, we can hold each other because of, we all believe we are runners, we all believe we have Ethiopian food, we all believe we can share what we have. I think it can still be able to do this. Hardly any difference with what is what Rwanda is and how that transitional justice mechanism can be able to pan out in, within the Ethiopian society. I don't know whether I've answered that question, Martin. It's long and winding, but uh, certainly times you have to to do, uh, to answer what you can't be able to answer, but you ask. <clears throat> thanks, thanks, Ms. Mas, you have answered that question. Uh, there is a hand up from uh, one of our distinguished guests, Chianga Kena. So, Cornell, please uh, make a, uh, please uh, make a speaker. And that is one more question for, Achen, please go on, I can see. Uh, thank you so much, Martin. Thank you, Chair, thank you. Um, panelists for such an invigorating discussion. Um, I just wanted to augment a little bit on the on the question that Dismas just answered in relation to traditional justice mechanisms. I think that um, probably the first thing I should I should say is that um, if the transitional justice process is a pe is people centered, um, 
and is led by people's needs uh, and includes people in decision making that happens, then um, people are the ones who determine what amounts to justice for them um, and determine which mechanisms uh, work best in the with, with the particular issue that they are um, dealing with. And I was very enamored by Anna's uh, uh, reference to having different justice solutions, and I'm paraphrasing, uh, to having different justice solutions um, that target different <clears throat> components uh, of, of justice uh, and, and you know um, reconciliation that are required. So if you look at Northern Uganda, for example, traditional justice mechanisms have been used inter-community, so within uh, particular communities to reintegrate um, uh, 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 perpetrators who, especially um, victim perpetrators, so people who are involved in the conflict, but as a result of being abducted as children. So reintegrating them into the community, they use traditional justice mechanisms, uh, particularly Matoput. Um, traditional justice has also been used inter-community, so uh, between the um, the Choli and the Langi, because there was a sentiment that it is the Choli who brought the war. And so in order to be able to make peace with the communities around them, they did use traditional justice mechanisms. We've also seen traditional justice mechanisms being used in Northern Kenya amongst uh, warring communities uh, during, you know, during post-election period. Um, and, and I think it's not it's not just uh, it's not an externally led process if it's an internally led process then the communities know how to apply um various traditional justice uh, uh, mechanisms to a situation and usually it will be a mixture of um the, the communities will have two ceremonies to honor you know both communities or, or three communities or however it is. So I think the 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 key issue here is um, having a people-centered or people-led process. Um, thank you, Martin. Uh, thanks, Achen. Um, there's one more question uh, that I wanted to pose to, uh, to Dr. Egon. And uh, from one of the participants of the question is, um, uh, what what would be the ideal strategy for effective accountability in relation to human rights violations committed by non-Ethiopian, uh, particularly Eritrean forces? Uh, can this be dealt with under an Ethiopian national TJ process, or is an international component needed in your view, uh, Dr. Bieber? Uh Thank you, Martin. Yes. Uh, I think one of the the, 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 the failures uh, of the cessation of hostilities agreement and the process so far is that it does not take into account, uh, as the uh, individual has already noted, does not take into account violations and abuses that have been committed by Ethiopian, uh, uh, for, uh, by Eritrean forces. And the transitional justice process envisaged uh, under the cessation of hostilities agreement only concerns itself with uh, Ethiopia and Ethiopians. And therefore, uh, a, 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 a broader process uh, involving, I think, international elements will be able to uh, more effectively deal also with violations uh, that have been committed uh, in uh, by Eritrean forces. And here we also know that uh, for a long time, there's been a, a, a commission also on human rights violations committed in Eritrea long before the conflict. And uh, Eritrea has also been uh, uh, blockading, uh, resisting, discrediting international mechanisms that have been established to investigate human rights violations committed in Eritrea. So it, only, it, can, it can only lead to one conclusion that uh, an international uh, mechanism will be most effective uh, in dealing with violations and abuses committed by Eritrean forces in Ethiopia. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Begon. Uh, colleagues, distinguished guests, um, I hope our panelists, speakers have been able to answer all the questions that you posed uh, in the chat section. At this point in time, I would now want to invite uh, 
Uh, Mr. Cornelius Odor, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the Kenya Human Rights Commission, uh, to give his closing remarks and uh, way forward. Cornelius. Uh, Thank you, Martin. Uh, thank you, panelists, for a wonderful discussion that we've had. Connect think... please, turn on, please turn on your camera. I can't see it, probably. Just allow me to proceed. Okay, let's, let's proceed, let's proceed. Yeah, I think we've had a very enriching discussion uh, since morning, and uh, Okay, I was being added into the panel. Uh, thank you, thank you. The team. I think there was a small challenge with the with the connectivity, but uh, it, all the the discussions have actually appreciated the fact that uh, despite the many glaring gaps, uh, this agreement has achieved one thing: that uh, there has been cessation of uh, hostilities. And uh, there's no active uh, war currently uh, in the northern part of Ethiopia, as we've now been made to, to, to understand that it's beyond the Tigrayan region, because it has also been uh, acknowledged that uh, there has been intensification of conflict in other parts of Ethiopia uh, beyond uh, what was originally referred as the Tigrayan region. So I've just tried to compress, I know there are several issues that have emerged, but I've tried to compress uh, some of uh, the issues that have emerged. Uh, one, which is very critical, is the apparent loop-sided and skewed agreement. Uh, it has been acknowledged across the board that uh, this agreement largely favors the government side and is something that uh, is increasingly uh, being seen to be related to the rejection of certain provisions of the agreement. And this has been compounded by the, the power imbalance in the implementation of the agreement. So this is going to be very critical uh, moving forward. Another thing that has been raised uh, is the presence of the Eritrean troops uh, in the northern uh, Ethiopia or the Tigrayan region, and this was uh, supposed uh, to have been dealt with, but it appears the Eritrean forces are still uh, present in the northern region. Uh, there's more focus on the Tigrayan region as opposed to other parts of Ethiopia, uh, which is something that is uh, blinding us to other atrocities and uh, human rights violations in the larger part of Ethiopia. Then there's the issue of the conflict-related sexual violence. This has been mentioned time and again. That is, uh, uh, despite the many reports by international NGO civil society organization, uh, this appears not to have been given the due attention. If anything, there has been no recognition and there has been no condemnation of the sexual uh, or the violence uh, that, or the conflict related sexual violence in, in Ethiopia. And this is something that uh, we really need to take up uh, with the AU. Uh, very interesting, the apparent conf uh, conflicted situation of the AU in this whole affair. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, AU is currently hosted in Addis Ababa and uh, the silence that was seen uh, by the AU until these issues, the agreement was signed, is very telling that the AU has not taken a very strong position on this matter because of what is seen as a conflicted situation. Uh, another very critical issue was uh, the gaps in the legal framework to achieve comprehensive justice and reparation for the victims. 
internally and even in the African region, it appears we are not very solid with the legal framework, and this might have far-reaching implication on the justice and accountability uh, and even reparation for the victims. There's the apparent uh, campaign by the Ethiopian government uh, against uh, institutions or actors that uh, are supposed to facilitate justice, the Commission of Inquiry, the Independent Human Rights Commission. And this is really causing a lot of concern with respect to the space, the space that is required to facilitate uh, accountability in the whole affair. So this is a concern that the same government that uh, is part of this agreement appears to be on a path of actions that ultimately are going to uh, really uh, interfere with the process of, uh, of, 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 of justice for the victims. Uh, it was also noted the issue of the rushed, the apparent rushed process to defeat justice, that the speed with which this agreement is being implemented is all but aimed at defeating justice and quite a number of stakeholders, more importantly the victims, are not uh, part and parcel of this process. Uh, of course, moving forward, uh, it's very critical that uh, a holistic approach is adopted where all important actors within and outside uh, Ethiopia are involved, and more importantly, involvement of the survivors and victims. Uh, and this needs to be uh, achieved through uh, a consolidated effort to ensure that the survivors are empowered through civic awareness, we would like civic education, so that we can have meaningful uh, participation, uh, their meaningful participation in the, in the entire process. Uh, it has been agreed that uh, this forum needs to push the uh, African Union to put pressure on the Ethiopian government, because apparently uh, they appear to be on a 50-50 basis, not very clear and not taking very serious or strong stand on this matter with regard to the engagement of the Ethiopian government. Uh, we need to push for recognition and condemnation of the sexual, uh, sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, the reports that are, uh, have been alluded to almost more than 20,000 women have reported cases, and this could be more, that we could be having more than what has been reported. So this, there appears to be a large scale uh, conflict related sexual uh, violence uh, in, in, in various parts where uh, we've experienced uh, conflict uh, in Ethiopia. So I think it's a good start mm, for me, I think, is to see how we are able to consolidate this as we move towards the media African Union uh, meeting uh, so that we are able to speak with one voice and as a late, very critical issues for their attention, uh, uh, lest uh, we find ourselves again in a very big mess uh, because of the lessons that we are picking from other regions where uh, these kind of processes are kind of given us hope only for them to reappear in a way that is beyond our imagination. Thank you, Martin.